Hello. Uh, so today the Frankenstein and uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth uh, episodes of Fishbone. Um, the Frankenstein episode is one I have very clear memories of, uh, perhaps in part because the I've read the book twice and had it read to me once. Um, and it's just everybody knows all about Frankenstein. The uh, episode originally aired on Halloween uh, in 1995, so that was fun. I usually don't look at when the uh, original episodes aired, but and it, they seem to have aired like um, every day, uh, with, I guess except weekends. Um, but uh, I guess, I mean, that's, that's uh, different than um, I am used to, and uh, probably than most uh, episodes aired week to week, but um, was a different time and a different station. But anyway, um, I was watching it and I was thinking uh, as it kind of zoomed by certain uh, aspects of the book, uh, but kind of hinted at them, and I was thinking this might be the most faithful to the novel of all the adaptations uh, for what it is. Um, I, uh, I'm on record in my small corner of the internet as not being a huge fan of any adaptations of Frankenstein. Theater, uh, film, um, the parodies I do tend to like Young Frankenstein I love, but, and I'll get to the, the details, this one I, uh, I really liked and for what it is I didn't have many complaints. Um, so the, the, the real, real life uh, plot is a science fair and uh, in Oakdale at the school, Joe and David are entering. I don't know if Sam is entering. I don't even know if she appears in the episode at all. Um, but uh, Joe, and we see early on, Joe is gluing together some bones into not anything that ever necessarily existed, but I guess the idea is that he found the bones and he knew where they went. And you see Wishbone bringing him a beautifully bleached jawbone uh, right when he's saying, I need a jawbone. And it just, it's a kind of, it's cute. Uh, and it, it kind of makes sense that he would, that Wishbone would have something to do with collecting the bones. But it's still, it's a little, it's delightfully weird to have Joe, to have Wishbone have found so many bones, many of them quite big, uh, and, uh, th and bringing them to Joe so that Joe can create a monstrosity. Uh, that's just, it's nicely weird. And then um, David's project is a robot, but he's, He's, uh doesn't want people to, to see it before it's ready. Uh, it's just, so it's kind of like Frankenstein doesn't want people to see the monster before it's ready and then doesn't want, want them to see it at all. Um, and we find out that uh, Wanda invented a very, very sticky glue, which she uses to help Joe. Um, the, uh, we, we finally meet the robot when Wishbone sneaks in to uh, David's garage after Joe and and hides and stays there, referring to himself as science dog uh, on a uh, on a mission. And then David shows his sister, who's not going to be at the science fair, so that's why he reveals the uh, the uh, robot, which is a giant rolling heavy piece of machinery that he's got on top of a table, right at the edge of the table. It didn't seem safe, um, but uh, you know, the the most brilliant minds are also the messiest and most careless. Um, so let's see. Um, the robot is uh, awakened by nature, the robot, and it's an unrealistic thing as so much of the technology, uh, even especially the technology that David invents in the show is kind of unrealistic, but the robot is awakened by a storm. Uh, there's a little bit of lightning in the storm. It awakens the robot without it being turned on, and that is the idea of the robot that nature is very powerful, um, which is a good message, but doesn't really make sense, but that's fine. And then eventually the robot kind of runs away, not in a Frankenstein's monster way where it's seeking purpose, but it just runs away because it's been activated and maybe even supercharged by nature. So the adaptation of Frankenstein. Um, first of all, uh, great for the size, for just emphasizing how huge the monster is. Um, you know, you get uh, two human actors playing Frankenstein and the monster. One of them has to be enhanced, even if he's already uh, a larger than average sized human. 
but in this case, uh, Frankenstein is played by a Jack Russell Terrier, which is a very small dog, and the monster is played by a full-sized human, and it uh, works very nicely. Um, and it's a, it's a very different design than the uh, classic Boris Karloff, which I guess is all adaptations, try to do their own designs for the most part, but this was the first time I saw anything other than, I hadn't even seen the Boris Karloff movie, I don't think, I had seen my dad's uh, flat top for his Frankenstein monster uh, costume, and I'd seen pictures, and I'd seen the uh, Burger King action figures, and the fact that the monster had a human-shaped head was weird to me um, when I first saw it. Um, and also, he started out bald, but then he, he grew hair over time to, to um, emphasize the passage of time. The... the the awakening of the monster involves electricity like it does with David's robot. Uh, electricity, I don't believe, is involved in the, uh, is involved in classic depictions like Boris Karloff, but not in the novel. Um, and let's see, I don't think it is anyway. Um, so there's no, it can't hit everything uh, from the novel, but uh, for instance, it shows a lot of Frankenstein stumbling around villages, people shunning him. Um, doesn't show him kill anybody. You don't want that in a children's show, and I can forgive that. Um, it does have him uh, plunging through the woods at one point, and you see a young man just chopping wood, and it's a nod to the time that Frankenstein's monster spends uh, in the woods. Um, I almost said Frankenstein. I almost referred to the monster as Frankenstein. That's why I said Frankenstein's monster instead of just the monster anyway. Uh, it refers, it's a reference to, kind of, I think, intended to be a reference to the, the time that the monster spends in the woods learning to speak, learning humanity, getting to know the old man and his family. Um, the the woodchopper sees the monster, but uh, they don't interact or anything. So that I like that. And then uh, the next time the monster speaks, or this is the first time the monster speaks, and it's the next time Frankenstein sees the monster, um, and the, the, the monster starts speaking to him, and it didn't bother me at all as a kid, and it wouldn't. And kids don't care how the monster learned to speak, so I, I let that go too. I'm, I'm very forgiving, which might be why it's my uh, ostensibly my favorite adaptation of the book. Uh, but kids don't care. The kids see adult human and assume it knows how to speak, and that's how I was. Um, when I later learned the actual story, uh, it, that's better, but... Uh, again, that was alluded to. Um, and similarly, in the uh, book, the monster, as so this interaction is the monster asking Frankenstein to create another monster, a friend, a companion. And in the book, Frankenstein gets quite a ways along the uh, path toward actually doing that, and then decides not to and destroys it, uh, and thus creating the uh, even more anger and rage in the monster. Um, but they just, and they do that, the monster says, make me a friend, and, and Frankenstein says no. So they just sped through that, but they did have that aspect in there. And uh, so I really liked that. And then uh, the end, they, they made it more, uh, it, it ends pretty much the same uh, as the novel. It's perhaps a little uh, uh, more, a little less disturbing uh, just for, for kids. Um, and I wrote down that the, the um, show, the, or the story of David's uh, robot and all that, um, the, uh, is, is maybe goofier than usual, uh, because Frankenstein, however they kid it down uh, for kids, uh, is still very heavy material, and so they made the... Um, the rest of the story a little goofier, I think, with the robot. The way that it runs muck is uh, very, very goofy. Um, and if I'm not careful, I will talk forever about Frankenstein. So I will move on now to um, Hot Diggity Dog, which is the um, adaptation of a, a Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne. And it turns out I haven't read that. I've read 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and I have read Around the World in 80 Days. I have not read Journey to the Center of the Earth. I will. I'll get to it. I, I really want to now after I've seen this. Not as much as Silas Marner, but uh, but quite a bit. 
um, just one thing. Uh, I don't. It, it didn't. Wishbone didn't do the thing that I'm thinking of in either of these episodes, to my knowledge. But I, I think that Wishbone's got like a recurring thing where he jumps and he twists, like the dog, the dog trick, and he goes watcha or something like that. And so in this, his character, um, and I don't know the character's name off the top of my head, Professor or something, Professor Otto Lindebrock has an accent, and uh, at one point, uh, the uh, in the Journey to the Center of the Earth adaptation portion, they are uh, they run out of water, and um, but then one of the characters discovers water coming out of the wall, a wall, and the uh, professor, Wishbone, with his accent sa uh, says, "You know what he found? Water," and I am convinced that uh, that is uh, a reference to that it was in deliberately sounded like when Wishbone does the trick. Um, but it's funny how when you think, when something happens maybe probably often over the course of a thing, it's, re it's recurring, and then you see something that's probably a reference to that, you can't think of any specific instances of, it's even I've been watching these episodes, I can't think if it's happened, it probably has in the first uh, 15 episodes, but I can't think of an uh, instance of Wishbone doing that, and maybe I'm making it up, but I don't think I am. But anyway, um, Journey to the Center of the Earth is, uh, of course, a story about just that. It's a journey to the center of the Earth. They go down through a volcano, they walk through caves and things, and I guess they ultimately make it. I, I've never read the book, uh, and I don't know uh, how much to trust the, uh, the Wishbone version. But um, the story that they tell on top of that, the, the story of the, in the real world, involves uh, Wanda's Arbor Day tradition of planting a tree. She plants a tree every Arbor Day. Um, and uh, in this year, in the show, um, she's planting it in uh, Joe and Ellen's uh, lawn. And I hope, I assume she got permission to do this. Uh, they don't seem to mind. And she enlists the kids to help dig. And ultimately Wishbone does the digging because he's a dog and dogs dig. Um, and he digs very fast. Um, I've never actually seen, I guess I've seen dogs dig, but not the way Wishbone does. By the way, I noticed for the first time uh, that Wishbone's collar, you know, the one that's always falling off, um, has uh, a Wishbone logo on it. And uh, so I I just, I noticed that, wanted to, it, like the show's logo. Um, and then I wrote down uh, Lord of the Rings for some reason. I forget why, but it uh, made my, the uh, malevolent supernatural force I live with, uh, kind of glare at me when I made the Lord of the Rings reference. Oh, it was uh, because it opens, Wishbone's kind of lazing on a chair, and that's when I saw the collar had the logo on it, and uh, Wishbone is disturbed by a tree brushing against the window. It's Wanda carrying a tree past the window. And I said, oh, maybe it's going to, uh, oh, I, and I did the Wishbone voice, and I said something along the lines of, this reminds me of the part of the Lord of the Rings where they had, where the Ents attack. And as though it were a Wishbone episode to be a Lord of the Rings reference, which they couldn't do because it's still under copyright. Um, that's another thing that I know. I know why they did those books. Those books are not under copyright. Uh, anyway, uh, so Wishbone takes over the digging and ultimately digs up a mysterious medallion type thing, which turns out to be a medal. Uh, I forget exactly what. It's from 1864. They can see that uh, Ellen translates some of the Latin and I actually forget the details of what the medal turns out to be, but it's another episode where, uh, kind of like digging up the past, um, f hidden treasures, and they go back and they find the rest of the medal because they, they determine from what they know, from what they can glean from the uh, inscription on the front that there must be a back to it. Uh, it, is, it seems to be made out of gold, so that's uh, a thing. They don't ultimately you know, sell it and make money from it because it's a historical document for from Oakdale, and so it ends up like, uh, under glass, a donation or something. Um, but, uh, you know, it's another look for things, be aware of things, the history is all around type of, uh, and it made me think of um, when I was a kid, my brothers and our friends and I would go exploring, there's kind of, uh, there are several woodsy areas near us, and we found not metals or anything special, um, we found an outlet at one point. Um, and things later on that we had hidden or just dropped when we were younger. Um, but we found a, a 
collection, in like in the backwoods, a collection of these white vases that, you know, cheap type stuff, but still ceramic or whatever. Um, and also, at one point, I, I found a, not a cupboard under the stairs like Harry Potter, but like a hidden area under the stairs where I, there's a, there's a little, little cupboard under the stairs, but then the, the, um, the, the floor of that lifts up and I could climb in when I was younger and smaller and I found a ton of bottles, which suggests that's where someone went with their drinking problem or something like that. Or somehow those bottles got down there and I can't think unless they were hiding a drinking problem. It's, but you don't know. Uh, this metal that they find has an inscription. They can make up a story from that, but they don't know. Uh, or, but I don't know because the bottles did not have inscriptions. And I think we recycled all of them. So at one point, I think I probably intended to keep them. Um, so let's see if there's anything more from this. Um, I wrote down approximately the production value of the Universal Monster movies. So there's that. There's a uh, CGI sea monster, briefly. Um, and that was cute. Uh, wishbone. Oh. Um, at the, at the, when they go back to dig more, they end up hitting a pipe that, uh, I guess, from the uh, sprinkler system for the, for the lawn, which doesn't look well watered in this episode. Um, so in the hole, water sprang up. And then after they turn all the water off, Wishbone goes in to dig, brings up the rest of the metal, emerges completely spotless. And Wishbone, if you've never seen an episode, is white. Um, some spots, but mostly white. And he is spotless when he comes up out of the wet, muddy hole. So continuity there. Um, let's see, uh, Noah Johnston is the planted trees in Oakdale, uh, um, so a hero to Wanda, that's who the metal belongs to, um, and the ending of the episode was kind of weird, um, Wishbone crawls down back into the hole, I guess they say something, Wishbone want to go eat or something, and he says, no, I've got more adventures, and he crawls down into the hole, and then it shows a camera uh, facing up from the hole, Wishbone continuing to climb down past the camera, suggesting it's much deeper hole than it could be realistically, and they are all looking down like, what is Wishbone doing? Where is Wishbone going? So it's, it kind of uh, suggests that Wishbone is really a magic dog. Um, but uh, it's, it's just a, a fun uh, ending. Probably they don't, they don't do stuff like that uh, too often. Uh, I'll find out. I haven't done it so far, but just suggesting that they see Wishbone as magic um, an interesting way to end it. So, next week, uh, 1001 Nights, uh, Alibaba and the Forty Thieves, and Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I'm familiar with some of the 1001 Nights tales, uh, and, uh, I have read The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So, until then, let's wag another tail.